Welcome to Bitch Talk, Booze and Interviews, straight from the heart of San Francisco. This is Ange, that's Aaron. Hi. We got Shar on the ones and twos. You can find us on our spanking new website, bitchtalkpodcast.com. You can also find us every morning from 6 to 6.30 a.m. at bff.fm. Boing. <laughs> and we're taking you back to Sundance, this time with a really great documentary. Uh, we were lucky enough to speak to Julie Noonham, the filmmaker, and Jim Lebrecht who is a filmmaker and also a uh, talent in the, in the documentary. It's called Crip Camp. This is a documentary about uh, essentially a summer camp that was started in the 50s and, and went on for a couple of decades um, for kids that were uh, disabled. And it became sort of a, a life of its own. It became a sort of Woodstock euphoric place for these kids to come and and feel free and, and most importantly to feel normal um and yeah it was a really great time talking to them and and hearing about uh jim's experience not only as part of the camp but in making this documentary so i hope you enjoy the interview and we'll see you on the other side John Wildman here with my co-host from Bitch Talk, Aaron Lim and Angela Tabora. And we're going to be talking about the documentary Crip Camp. We have the two filmmakers, Nicole Noonan and Jim Lebrecht, who is also a subject in the film, as well as being a co-director. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks. And we'd like to start this off by letting you introduce our audience to what the film is about. Jim? Nicole, who's taking it? <laughs> so the film is about this amazing happening that, that occurred in 1971 at this radical summer camp uh, for kids with disabilities that had was being run by hippies. And, um, and that camp, which Jim attended, ends up sparking the disability rights movement because the experience of liberation and freedom and joy that kids who normally at that time were facing you know, a future of sort of isolation, discrimination, and sometimes cases even institutionalization was was so profound that um, that they were inspired. You guys were inspired to to fight for a better life. It's one of those things that once you uh, experience a, a, a better life, that you'll do anything you can to get it back again, to cultivate it and protect it, and that's really the story of the of the film in, in a kind of in a nutshell to the extent that the advocacy that we the community that we found there and the advocacy that we believe that we could take into our lives to improve the lives of people with disability was possible you know if you don't and meeting judy human was one mm-hmm. of the big characters um in the in film she you know for me as a 15 year old and she was there, and she had um, won a lawsuit against the um, uh, in New York City the school district to teach. She is a wheelchair user. And they told her, oh, no, no, you're a fire hazard, and you won't be able to discipline her, your children. or Anybody, anybody that meets Judy Human knows that she can discipline anyone. <laughs> and I think she's a force, force, of, force she's of a nature. Boss. Yeah, like, really, she really is. Yeah, um... Can we talk about the incredible um, footage that you have from the camp? And um, I was really struck by the real conversations that we got to hear around the table and um, also the conversation about wanting to be alone as someone that who is disabled. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Either well, the, by the person that was there or by the person that was directing? Well, so in the summer of 71, this group called the People's Video Theater um, happened to bump into some people from camp at a gas station. It's like, gee, who are all you folks with wheelchairs or crutches? And, hey, what's that video equipment and such? And it's like, come over to our camp. And uh, we're having our camp Olympics. And and then wow. they they show up there, and the first thing they're faced with is, um, well, two of the counselors had gotten the crabs. Thank you for bringing that up. And, I literally yeah. have crabs right, right at the top of my notes, so thank you. And, um, and here, here's this camp where some of the campers are going home in a few days, right? And so immediately the camp director, you know, says we have to, everybody has to get shampooed. So they show up and there's like, like all the sheets are in the swimming pool. There's clothing hanging for the backstop of the baseball field. 
And uh, well, that was after they got in, right? Yeah. First, they showed up at the gate, and the gate was closed, and they couldn't get in. So they just sat down and dropped some acid. <laughs> as you, as do. you do. I yeah. mean, you got some free yeah. time. Yeah. 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 Why not? So then, you know, a number of hours later, the the, the folks from the camp came out and said, hey, now you can come in. And that's the first thing they saw. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and the uh, remarkable thing about this is that they were taking this new technology, this portable video, and they wanted to bring it to marginalized communities. And so they came in there basically... Um, when they got introduced to us at camp saying, look, you know, help us make a video about this camp. You know, we want your input. So what, the two kind of extraordinary things for me was that they strapped the video deck to my handlebars of my wheelchair, and then I was holding the camera, and somebody pushed me around the camp and why the, the other person was asking me questions. So I did a camp tour. We've been filming this we've been making this film for almost 50 years here mm -hmm. right wow i mean it's, it's kind of extraordinary and that conversation around the table so, you know they said you know do you you know just tell us what you'd like to do and we wanted to do a um video for our parents and mm -hmm. it's and just like a message to parents about overprotectiveness and what that feels like and um what was happening and Yes, that stunning moment where this woman, Nancy, um, talks about never having privacy, that her mother's always there. She never has a moment alone. And, um, and you know, it's you would think that, oh, everybody gets a chance for privacy, and it's something you just don't quite think about. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say that the footage, um, Jim remembered filming the tour and he remembered that the group was there but didn't quite remember their name and it was mm. it took like months of um like basically me hunting around on the internet until i finally found like a little notice in an old magazine about radical video groups at the time that said crabs outbreak at camp <laughs> <laughs> people's video theater wow. and then was able to track down howard gutstadt and ben levine wow the, it all comes theater. back to crabs in but the end you, doesn't you, it you remember the, that table conversation right it, you know no, until I, you saw the footage so yeah. literally like we didn't know he was like i think i filmed a tour but we didn't know if it was you know they said yeah we have five and a half hours of footage and we happen to just be in the process of digitizing it and we got a hard drive delivered to the office and basically just sat there, you know, with you weeping because it was just like, Aww. you know, it was incredible. Like there were, there was your first girlfriend. There was, you know, these, these raw, deep conversations from the moment. And what made us so excited is that I was as transfixed as Jim. You know, I just felt like I could sit here and watch this footage all day long because it's so unusually, um, like you said, just sort of like raw and honest. open and honest. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, that segues into my next question, which is, um, but we still need to make a film. Just putting what happened, you know, we can have nine hours of footage, and, and, that, that, and, you know, and, and when, when it's Jim's story, yes, that's great, but we're presenting it for an audience, which means you need to make some tough decisions in, in, in the editing room. And when you're working with a, a co-filmmaker who's also mm -hmm. within that, then there are sometimes some complicated conversations. I would love for the two of you to talk about that of 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 the of, of the you know what you had to leave on the cutting room floor uh, and and th those kind of things and how you two worked in tandem to achieve that. Being a, a subject, but also being one of two directors, um, I just kind of felt like I couldn't leave anything unsaid, mm -hmm. and that there was a great deal of trust that if I said something. And either that, you know, and if I feel, you know, I feel uncomfortable about this, that I was, I knew that that would be respected. Because in, in, in the film earlier on, talked about growing up a little bit more. And one of my parents was an alcoholic and how tough that was. Um, but in the long run, like you say, there's tough decisions to make. And being able to really kind of focus the, the story and... Um, yeah, I mean it's a unique film because it's a it is a, a a history documentary. Like it relates a really important story out of American history that many people don't know and need mm -hmm. to know and should know. So that was important. It was important for us to tell that story 
uh, collectively through the voices of people that, you know, Jim, I know you felt really passionately people needed to meet. People needed to meet a diverse group of people from the community and hear their stories. And it was important to have Jim's perspective be the perspective that the audience enters the film from. And, and his personal perspective is what carries you through. So when you get to, you know, after the kind of joy of the camp, you get to that Willowbrook expose mm. where you see that horrendous institution. You're now looking at that institution as somebody who's kind of been, you know, into this amazing environment and you feel like those are your friends, you know, that you're, that, that you're saying this could have happened to. And you're hearing mm. Jim's point of view. So we, we worked really, I think we worked hard to kind of, well, it was fascinating actually because in some, in some respect, I think you discovered things about your own story yeah. in the process of reacting to the, the history and the footage that we saw, you know? And so we, we tried to kind of have the audience go kind of along on that journey of discovery with Jim, that really intimate uh, point of view from, from the inside. I mean, one of the first things that we were really exploring that didn't really wind up being in the film was my sense that I had abandoned the community at one point. I had come to Berkeley. I was working at the Berkeley Repertory Theater. Um, eight film, eight shows a year. I'm running the sound. I didn't have time for. I mean, I didn't have time to wash my underwear. But yet I felt like here are these people I knew from Camp Jeanette and I'm not spending time with them and I'm not getting involved and and really questioning within myself whether I feel felt like I had passed and that I really wasn't part of that community because here I am at this wonderful theater with all these fabulous people and in reflection and really kind of feeling it out I didn't really abandon them I was doing what the Judy Human said, we had our eyes on you the whole time. <laughs> that you had you had the life that we were striving for people to have, which was a life, a, you know, a job that wasn't disability related. And when uh, I was able to have more time to come back to the community, um, I did. And um, um, and I think that we've kind of talked a bit about this film feeling like this is something to bring back to the community that well, I, well, really it's, I mean it's wonderful now that you just brought it back to, to that community to your community um, but that it offers a wonderful introduction to the wider community to everyone else as far as both your experience as well as as you say Nicole the, the, the history lesson of that struggle um, you know to, to, to get each one of those uh, um, laws enacted and then actually um, effectively utilized, uh, it, it, it really it really is an experience. And again, it's been wonderful to have you both here. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. So that was our interview with Nicole Newnham and Jim Lebrecht of Crip Camp. And, you know, a the irony of us doing this interview, Erin, I don't yes. know if you remember, but yes, um, I do. was yep. that, you know, Jim is disabled and he is in a wheelchair and we were having trouble finding space for him. Mm -hmm. And that was, <laughs> I mean, essentially what they've been fighting for since, you know, for decades. Yeah. And, and here we are in 2020 uh, still having the same issue. So, you know, thankfully we were able to work it out. We found a, a, a space that would, um, suffice but but that was kind of ironic in, when we were dealing with uh yeah i was I, I was feeling for the publicist who actually used to be my uh roommate here in san francisco oh that's <laughs> uh, right whatever. yeah i was feeling for her because um i mean obvious obviously not obviously park city is not really set up for folks that um are differently abled or are able-bodied um so it was a uh, you know we figured it out, um, and with the help of our friends at Slam Dance, they helped us figure that out too. But uh, yeah, it was a it was a tricky it was a tricky one. Um, mm -hmm. but Jim was great, and he's mm -hmm. actually, from what I understand, he's still a Bay Area guy. He lives uh, here, and uh, maybe we'll have to have him back on the show sometime after all of this. But I thought I found him to be so charming and funny, and mm -hmm. um, a great outlook for someone who's just. Um, it's been hard his whole life, 
mm-hmm. uh, trying to just be someone that's quote unquote normal, um, but really found the documentary to be, um, it was, it started out as one thing and I was like, what's going on here? And then it turned into like what actually happened for um, like disabled rights. I think it was the in the yeah. 70s, 60s or 70s that was happening. Yeah. yeah and it um, started in the 50s and then yeah. yes, it was like 60s and 70s. Yeah, and it was just interesting because a lot of it happened in the Bay Area, and I had no idea. Um, San Francisco City Hall. Yeah, of the yeah. history. So, really great film. It's on Netflix. We didn't mention that. It's on Netflix right now, streaming. Um, and it was also produced or helped produce by the Obamas, of course. Uh, so, you know, we were like yeah. one step away from the Obamas at this we're, point. We're getting closer with every interview. But I, I do love, yeah, the, the one thing that I really took from this documentary was the message of like, we're not the ones with the problem that needs to be fixed. It's your all's mindset. Like you guys need to flip your mindset. Like we're just fine, you know? Right. Um, treat us like equals and give us equal rights. That's it. So yeah. uh, that was an important message. And yeah, it was a really fun conversation. I have a feeling it's going to get nominated for something. Mm. Just FYI. That That's is the bitch talk bump. Gut. It is. is bitch talk <laughs> it's my gut. I mean, the subject matter is so topical, and I don't see how it wouldn't be nominated, if not um, Academy Awards, something. We could just talk to them again at the uh, red carpet at the Independent Spirit Dude. Awards. You mean when we get to sit at a table with people and drink? Yes. And hang I out accept. with Aubrey, Aubrey Plaza? <sighs> One day. Anyways, um, yeah, that was if it, it, I mean, people are home now, so and I'm pretty sure most people have Netflix, not all, but uh, find Crypt Camp, it's it's excellent. Don't forget to find us at fishhoppodcast.com and every Monday morning at bff.fm from 6 to 6 30 a.m. We're powered by GoTo Productions, bitch, please.